all of our charity is inspired by and based on nature's networks. For example, networks in nature, and in tech in fact, tend to be distributed, like you can see over on the right-hand side here. So I'm not a director, I used to be a director, but now I'm a co-director. That means uh, I've got another few people directing with me and all our decisions are, collaboratory, uh, are made collaboratively. And that extends all the way through the business as well. So for example, I'm very interested in hearing what, my, what the projects have to tell me about how they want to do things. Also, the businesses that we work with, they make direct connections with projects. Rather than centralising your money and then sending out where we think is a good idea, we'll ask you what you want to do, what you want to restore, how you want to work. And you can develop that connection with a frontline community doing reforestation or whatever it might be, however you want. So, for example, maybe your team wants to go and visit a project. Or maybe you want to help develop an app for them. Or whatever it might be. So, um, this is a slime mould. It is a, an amoeba. I'm going to be talking about them. I cultivate slime moulds. They are a high-intelligence, low-maintenance companion that I can keep in the jar without getting into trouble. Um, so, that's my one, actually. I was going to bring it here, but I left it in my sister's cupboard, which she wasn't very happy about. Um, <laughs> I'm also going to be talking about mycorrhizal, the mycorrhizal root network, which is how trees communicate underground to turn a forest into a superorganism, and they trade uh, information and nutrients on this network. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the internet, and this is ARPANET, the, the forerunner of the internet. It was designed to, the internet was designed to be a distributed network so it could survive a, a nuclear attack. Because if you have, a, if you have like Washington gets wiped out and the whole communication system gets wiped out, then you're in trouble. So it's designed in a similar way to a slime mold with redundancy and lots of nodes that can uh, then connect more nodes that are required to transmit a message. So the question that my charity was set up to ask was how can the collective intelligence of a distributed global collective respond to challenges we fail to meet as individuals? Because we're facing quite a lot of threats as a planet, as a people. Um, and they all, they're all interconnected in some way. So, for example, if we're dealing with shifting weather patterns, we're also dealing with uh, food shortages, famine, movement of refugees, political instability. And these things are all linked in a quite deep fashion. And our responses being piecemeal is not really going to cut it. So it's great if you go and do a beach cleanup or if you try to reduce your carbon footprint. But if we're not communicating and we're not coordinating, I just simply don't believe it's going to work. So that was the idea of the network. Uh, how can we facilitate communication? Collective intelligence is a term coined by Bruno Latour, who died earlier this year. Um, and he noted that every time there's an advance in tech, the collective intelligence of humanity increases. So, for example, when we develop language, we could share our thoughts. When we develop writing, we could store our thoughts. And when we developed the printing press, we could distribute our thoughts. And now we're on the brink of a tech revolution, which your sector is driving, not on the brink, actually, in the early stages. And who knows what we might be able to do when we network properly and think together. So let's have a look at uh, slime molds, my, my favorite things. Um, they're single-celled amoeba. They're too small to see with the naked eye. And they have no brains and no nervous systems, but they behave in a collective fashion to respond to the changing environment. So they're like humid places in the forest, but if their log starts to dry, for example, as an individual amoeba, there's not a whole lot they can do, but what they do is they collectivize, and they come, into, they come together, and they, they produce these beautiful uh, tower structures, and then they explode, and then they spore, and that means that the individual amoeba can get into the air currents, go and find a better neighborhood, and a better chance of survival. What can an individual amoeba do about changing environment? Not very much. What can an individual human do about a changing environment, about melting ice caps? Mm, not very much. What can we do? We can come together. Mm. All kinds of things, I should think. Slime molds are really clever in many ways. If you put them in a maze like this, they like oats, by the way. It's their favorite food. Um, so if you put them in a maze like that, and then you put some oats on it, they will find the most, uh, the most efficient path on the maze. So they can solve mazes better than four-year-old children. And you can put them in jars. <laughs> Um, they also, if you put a whole bunch of oats out, they will explore the area and then they will find the most efficient ways of linking up those places. Uh, they did that in 23 hours and that is the Tokyo Railway Network. Um, they outdid the Japanese in efficiency of, um, of, of that network in 23 hours, which is pretty impressive. Um, 
So this is something that's quite important, uh, distribution of resources in a changing climate. For a charity, it's really important. For humanity, it's very important. I think for tech, it's very important as well. Often logistical problems to solve about how to distribute resources. Slime moles are intelligent in time. They do something a bit like farming. If they find a bacterial colony they can eat, they might eat some of it and then take some of it elsewhere and cultivate it so they can eat it later, which shows more intelligence than some adults presented with a packet of biscuits. <laughs> they also, if you blast cold, uh, dry air at them, they don't like it, so they retreat. And if you blast cold, dry air at them for five minutes, on the hour, every hour, they start to do something amazing. So the second time you do it, they retreat, but they retreat further. And the third time you do it, they've already spotted the pattern, and they're starting to anticipate. So five minutes before, they're already starting to retreat, which is amazing. They're tiny. You can't even see them. Um, on the fourth hour, they'll retreat, but they'll adapt. They'll notice that they haven't been blasted. And then if you wait a while and repeat this torture, they will recall and restart that pattern. You may be noticing some connections with machine learning there. And in fact, slime molds have been used to, uh, to work with, uh, with machine learning. For example, there's a slime mold algorithm which was derived by studying slime molds, and now it's been used uh, to make decisions in medical situations, uh, to predict water use in an urban context, and things like that. Slime molds are also being looked at for, um, for hardware as well. There's some research into memristors, which I think you probably know what they are. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure myself. But the idea that you can make computer components out of um, slime molds, pretty interesting. This is, fun. this is fascinating. They don't like salt, um, but if you put a slime mold and a salt bridge to food, they will learn to adapt to salt so they can cross the salt to go and eat. And then, which is almost, which is incredible, I think, if you take a little scraping of this, uh, of this slime mold and put it with another bunch of slime mold, it will teach its friends that it can cross salt to go and get some food. In fact, you can dry them out, you can reanimate them, rehydrate them six months later, and they still remember that, and they te they'll teach their friends. So there's a connection with learning about false positives there. I know false positives are a big problem in cybersecurity. <clears throat> Um, so, just summing up on slime mold, they uh, behave collectively for mutual aid and resilience, respond to a changing environment, they map territory, perceive rhythms in time, optimize distribution and resource management. All very, very important for humanity, very, very important for tech as well. The mycorrhizal root network. <laughs> so, this connects um, trees, as I said, uh, beneath the ground so they can trade resources, so they can inform each other about predators and pathogens and all those kind of things. Um, this is a map of fur and uh, yeah, fur in the Canadian forest done by Dr. Suzanne Simard, who's an absolute genius. Um, and she noticed and mapped out how they connect. So there are, there are different types of mycorrhizae. Myco, by the way, is fungus and rhizae is roots, so it's how roots connect to fungus. Um, so, for example, she found that one tree was linked to 47 other trees via one of these, uh, one of these fungal complexes, and one fungus li linked ni uh, 19 trees together. And this, 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 this fungus and this fungal network will spread through the entire forest, and it can live for centuries, or even millennia, as long as the uh, forest lives, really. Um, these guys are generalists. That means that this particular fungus will... Um, will meet and work with uh, different trees, and they'll pass, for example, nitrogen or um, water or carbon between firs and beaches uh, and birches because they, they help each other out at different times of the year when one is more adapted to, to getting water. So you'll see some connections there with how the internet is structured. And this particular type of mycorrhizae I'm talking about is ectomycorrhizae. So that means that the root is encapsulated in the fungus. The fungus doesn't go inside the actual cells. And you may see some connections with internet hardware in that particular example. There's another type of mycorrhizae I want to talk about, which is endomycorrhizae. And these guys, a bit different, they go inside the root and they go right into the cell machinery. And they, these guys are specialists. So that means they don't uh, they, they work with one particular tree and they work with one particular function. So for example, some of them might uh, fix nitrogen out of, the, out of the ground. Some of them might take phosphorus out of the hummus. Um, some of them host bacteria that produce antibiotics, which defend them from funguses. And for example, this is only on uh, uh, birch trees that this particular uh, mycorrhizae is found. But then that 
antibiotic is shared with fir trees in the area uh, on, on the other on the on the mycorrhizal root network, which helps the whole system look after itself and regulate itself. And if you plant a monoculture of just fir trees, they're very susceptible to honey fungus because they don't have this particular defense. Some of them work in summer, some of them work in spring. I think you can probably see the connection with programs here. These guys have very, very specific functions. And the way that their genetic code works as well, it's quite interesting because they will have the code for all of the enzymes and all of the structures that are needed for one particular process in a little piece of code like close together, a little bit like a program or an app. And, and there is, these things can move actually between funguses and even between species with what's called horizontal gene transfer, which I'll tell you more about if I had time. <laughs> um, so this is a bit more like the software, whereas the hardware, you know, trees take hundreds of years to go through their cycles. These guys, um, their life cycles are much shorter. They can respond quicker. They can switch on genes if there's a pathogen in the area. Uh, and they can respond a whole lot faster. And they get their updates. Uh, let's talk about messaging. This is um, a fungus with some electrodes in it. And if you do that, you can measure spike potentials coming out of these guys. Um, it's incredible. They communicate in a rather similar way that our brain cells communicate, with specific patterns of uh, electrical charge moving down these filaments. Um, and you can make an analogy there between words. And in fact, they cluster their words into something that looks very much like sentences. Oyster mushrooms, for example, have about 50 words that they use, 50 specific spike patterns. Uh, but they tend to only, most conversations involve 15 to 20 of them. And if any of you are familiar with the 80-20 law, uh, which is that 20% of things used, get used 80% of the time. So for example, in a language like English, the word the is used a whole lot more than the word xylophone, for example, that conforms to Zipf's law. And Zipf's law, which is that, predicts how frequently something will be used in a specific, uh, yeah, how frequently something will be used. So again, in a language, if you look at all the words on the internet, you will see that they conform to this particular logarithmic scale. And this is used to work out whether something is a language or not. So for example, most European languages conform to Zipf's law. That's English and that's Swedish. Uh, most fungus, in fact, all the fungus that have been studied, the words they use, the pattern they use, patterns they use also conform to Zipf's law. And you'll be very pleased to know that JavaScript and C++ also conform to Zipf's law. That, that means that the, 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 the commands that are used are used in that amount of uh, frequency, according to that logarithmic scale. Um, so isn't this fascinating? You've got spikes, you've got little bits of information um, electromagnetically transmitted down tubes. And that's what happens on the internet. That's what happens in, uh, in mushrooms. And in fact, it happens in all of the kingdoms. It happens in our brains. Um, you can see a, a, a spike trace there, although it's much faster. Oyster mushrooms leave about half, uh, half an hour between words. Um, there's a mushroom called Schizophyllum commune, which is the most complex, has the most complex language and the most complex conversations. It has 23,000 sexes. So they've got a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, so you find this in slime. <coughs> you find this in slime molds. You find this in plants. Uh, you even find it at the juncture between kingdoms, where the roots of a tree encounter the fungus of the mycorrhizal root network. They will communicate with these uh, with these electrical words, these electrical patterns. Um, very briefly, uh, we can also talk about chemical messaging. Um, if a tree or a plant, if a broad bean, for example, is attacked by uh, aphids, it will, send, it, will, it will produce something which attracts ladybirds to eat the aphids. But it also goes and tells its friends around it through the mycorrhizal root network that they should start turning on those genes that produce that defense chemical. These are called infochemicals, and you can probably see a connection there between how antivirus software works. Um, one last thing I want to say before we enter into the really strange bit of my talk, which is going to be about seven minutes. Have I got about seven minutes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Um, <clears throat> so uh, glutamate is the, the, the oldest of the neurotransmitters. And uh, it's also found in fungus, and it's also found in plants. So you've got these very similar networks, in a way, in our brains, and all through the world, communicating with exactly the same neurotransmitter. So let's just change pace a little bit. And let's go into our own networks. 
Let's start fiddling with glutamate. What I would like you to do, if you can, if you want to join me, I'm going to invite you to the command line of your own mind. And we're going to spend a moment just exploring the forest. <coughs> so, through a little bit of imagination work. So, what I'd like, invite you to do is just make yourself comfortable and put both your feet on the ground and take a look at this uh, beautiful mycelial uh, web there. And, yeah, we're gonna, I'm going to invite you to explore your imagination a little bit. And, obviously, your command line is your command line. So, I'm going to suggest a few commands. And if you want to apply them to your, to your mind and your brain and your hardware, then you can go ahead. But you're the one in control here. So, let's everyone take a nice deep breath and look at my, uh, look at my friend here. And then let that go. That's really good. And just take another breath and notice how you feel as you breathe. Notice that your breathing gets a little bit more relaxed all by itself as you focus on that thing. In a moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to shift your attention to a space, to a point in space halfway between that mycelia and your own eyes. So you can go ahead and do that now. Put all of your mind into that spot, into space, and notice how you feel. And if you hear cars going past, they're just triggers for you to relax. And if thoughts go through your mind, they're just triggers for you to relax. A little bit like a car going past when you're walking on the pavement. You just let it go. In, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to shift your attention to one inch in front of your eyes. You can go ahead and do that now. Maybe noticing your eyes are getting a little bit more tired, a little bit more relaxed. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to shift your attention to one inch behind the eyes. So go ahead and let those eyes close and let yourself go into a space of potential, into a space where you're in command. That's right, doing really, really well. What I'd like you to do now is just imagine yourself walking in the forest. And you can render this whole scene from your memory or you can construct a forest as we're, as we're speaking now. And it's autumn time, you can feel the crunch of the leaves beneath your feet. And you can smell the smells of the forest, and it's a little bit humid and it's cool, you can feel that coolness on your skin. Perhaps you can hear the sounds of the birds. And you're really enjoying walking in the forest. Just spending a little bit of time, we've got a few moments for ourselves here. Nothing to do, nothing to worry about, nothing to think about. Now, as you're walking in the forest, you come to a, an oak tree. I'd like you just to put your hand in your mind on that oak tree and feel the roughness of the oak tree on your hand. And then let's move around that oak tree as we're going around it. And you notice on the other side, it's one of those oak trees which is hollow in the middle. And it's got a lovely space about your size that you can comfortably sit in. And so I'd like you in your mind's eye to go and sit in that oak tree and as you do that, feel yourself just sinking down into the roots of the oak tree, down to the smaller roots. And notice what it feels like as you go down into that moist earth, full of potential, until you find yourself connecting to that mycorrhizal root network, that fungal network that spreads all the way across the forest. And it's full of connections. It's got hundreds of miles of curve of fungal threads in every square foot. So let's just start exploring that network. <coughs> People are here to make connections. People are here to network. So paint your mind into that place. And I'm just going to say a little poem for you. And as I'm doing that, I want you to explore this space and notice what it feels like. And maybe have a little bit of a and meditate on the kind of connections that you want to make and perhaps the kind of connections that you don't want to make as well. Mycelial lovers with multi-sexed others, we touch with our tendrils entangled in ether and earth and in time and in bodies in pleasure and pain, twisting twine tied in lines we deliver that tether dimensions in knots in forever. Love in the fingers that reach forth with ardor, love in the heart as it boils in its fervor, love in the stories we tell to each other, 
Love in the dendrites that dance as they measure mycelial lovers with multi-sexed others. We touch with our tendrils entangled in ether and earth and in time and in bodies in pleasure and pain. Twisting twine tied in lines we deliver that tether dimensions in knots in forever. Love in the fingers that reach forth with ardor. Love in the heart as it boils in its fervor. Love in the stories we tell to each other. Love in the dendrites that dance as they measure mycelial lovers with multi-sexed others. We touch with our tendrils entangled in ether and earth and in time and in bodies in pleasure and pain. Twisting twine tied in lines we deliver that tether dimensions in knots in forever. Love in the fingers that reach forth with ardor. Love in the heart as it boils in its fervor. Love in the stories we tell to each other. Love in the dendrites that dance as they measure. And then just taking another moment in that mycorrhizal root network, in that earth which contains all of the husks of the past, all the seeds of the present. And then let's draw ourselves back in, back into the roots and up the tree and into that little space in the tree. And you can give your fingers a wiggle and you can give your toes a wiggle. And when you're ready, you can come back to the room. We're here to network, everybody. We're here to talk. Um, I'd love to talk to you uh, later. Come and find me. Thank you very much. And I want to say one more thing. Um, so thank you to Fourway for having me here. Thank you, for, thank you to Microsoft, really, for putting $2 million into uh, regenerative agro agroforestry. The tech center is, can lead the way in ecosystem restoration. That's not just giving money. That also, that's also developing apps, developing tech. So I'm really, really excited to see where things go. Thank you very much.